We begin the day taking the talks over the Ukrainian crisis public. Today, at the request of the United States, despite the objections of Russia and China, the UN Security Council convened in New York, hoping to do what weeks of talks between the US, NATO, the European Union, Ukraine, and Russia have failed to do, reduce the probability and the fear of war. Today's meeting, as it stands this hour, did not change the entrenched positions of Moscow and Washington. The meeting did, however, reveal just how low relations between the U.S. and Russia have sunk. In fact, it hasn't been this bad since the Cold War ended some 30 years ago and caught right in the middle, Europe and Ukraine. Here is Ukraine's U.N. ambassador. Ukraine strongly rejects any attempt to use the threat of force as an instrument of pressure to make Ukraine and our partners accept illegitimate demands. There is no room for compromise on principal issues. The most principal position for Ukraine is that we have inherent sovereign right to choose our own security arrangements, including treaties of alliance which cannot be questioned by Russia. Moreover, this right is enshrined in many international legal instruments that Russia itself a party to. Well, my first guest tonight says this crisis over Ukraine is about more than the threat of a Russian invasion. It is about the transatlantic security order as we know it and Russia's determination to change it. In her latest book, Putin's World, Russia Against the West and with the Rest, Professor Angela Stent analyzes what is motivating Vladimir Putin, especially in his foreign policy. Professor Stent is a former U.S. National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia. She taught at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. She's a fellow at the Brookings Institution, and she is my guest this evening. Professor Stent, it's good to have you on the day. Um, as far as we know, nothing has changed on the ground following today's UN Security Council meeting. Do you think today's meeting will make a difference at all? I think it was very important to have the meeting today uh, because this is not just a crisis between Russia and the US and Europe. This is a crisis that can have global ramifications if there's a war. So it was very important to present it to the world, to all of the other countries to listen to this and to take in what it means to have a large neighbor threaten to invade a country for no apparent reason. I don't know whether it's going to move anything forward. Uh, clearly, China is going to back Russia in whatever it does. But I think it was important to get those cards on the table. You know, just a few days ago, Foreign Affairs published a piece by you entitled The Putin Doctrine. And you write that the crisis over Ukraine and Russia is a reckoning three decades in the making. Talk to me about that. How is it a reckoning? Because I think in the 1990s, the US and Europe tried to create a new Euro-Atlantic security order after the collapse of the Soviet Union in which Russia would have a stake, which Russia would believe in. But we were unable to do this. Uh, in the, really what had to happen was, or what did happen, was that the US and Europe really favored, if you like, the security concerns of Central and Eastern Europe, which after all had been over the centuries invaded and occupied by Russia. Those were favored over the interests of Russia, which would have been to kind of recreate a system where Russia had a sphere of influence uh, over the, let's say, post-Soviet states, which the West recognized. We weren't willing to do this, and this is where we are now. In 1994, the Partnership for Peace initiative launched, under which um, new allies would gain contingent membership in NATO, but only in phases. So this was the phased enlargement of NATO that was taking into consideration the, the border sensibility and sensitivities of Russia. Now, this idea did not last long. Does it deserve a resurrection? No, the partnership for peace at the time was seen as an alternative to membership. And that's what Boris Yeltsin understood when the Russians signed this agreement. So there was never an agreement that there was going to be a phased 
uh, enlargement of NATO. Uh, what happened was you had one wave in 1999 when three countries joined, and then the rest of them uh, in 2004, and then a couple more since then. So uh, as far as I know, NATO doesn't have any plans at the moment to accept any other countries maybe one or two Balkan countries if they qualify. But so the idea that there's going to be extensive further enlargement of NATO really doesn't reflect reality. Ukraine, let's talk a little bit about Ukraine's security trap, if you will. In 1994, Ukraine agreed to destroy its nuclear weapons and to join the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. Um, do you think when they're sitting behind closed doors in Kiev, they think that that was a mistake? I'm sure those conversations are taking place. I remember at the time there was a big discussion about, well, if we give up our nuclear weapons, are we going to make ourselves vulnerable? Yeah. And don't forget, of course, that the Russians did sign the Budapest Memorandum in 1994 when Ukraine shipped its nuclear weapons to Russia and the Russians guaranteed Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty. Let me ask you um, a little bit about the role of Germany in this crisis. I mean, Germany has been criticized heavily recently um, for only sending helmets to Ukraine and for being non-committal when it comes to using the Nord Stream 2 gas pipeline as a possible weapon to deter Russia or maybe even to punish Russia. We saw this under former Chancellor Angela Merkel and we're seeing it again now under the current Chancellor. This reluctance to take Moscow to task. Do you think Germany is engaged in sugarcoating history when it comes to Russia? Well, Germany obviously feels a historical responsibility for having twice invaded Russia and the Soviet Union in the 20th century, and in World War II, 26 million Soviet citizens died. So that's understandable. On the other hand, we do have to remember that the Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union began in Ukraine and Belarus. Uh, so, of course, there's a historical responsibility towards Ukrainians who died in World War II. I understand why Germany doesn't want to ship arms to Ukraine. It is part of the historical responsibility. I, be, I believe Germany is supplying uh, a field hospital to the Ukrainians. Germany is supplying other things to the Ukrainians, uh, short of weapons. And, and with the Nord Stream uh, pipeline, this is obviously an issue of contention in the current German government, certainly, because mm -hmm. the Greens, of course, uh, would be quite pleased to say that they would close it down. My understanding is that if there were to be a full-scale invasion of Ukraine, then I do think that the German government would think about or might agree to never opening Nord Stream 2. It feels like when we look at th th this whole crisis and what has been discussed just in the month of January alone, it feels like that we are trapped in the Cold War. Um, how will we be able to break out of this? I think in the longer run, the only if there if there is hopefully no invasion and no real war, um, we will have to, uh, as time goes on, reassess how we view Euro-Atlantic security and how we talk to the Russians about that. At the moment, I think it's impossible to do because we're not going to say NATO will never enlarge. Um, or NATO will retreat to where it was in 1997, which is what the Russians have now demanded. But there will have to be some, if you like, third reorganization of Euro-Atlantic security um, since 1945, and hopefully one in which Russia would have a stake and which would not encourage it to act in such a disruptive way. Is there um, a, a, an official organization, or is there any way that you could describe what this realignment or this reorganization would look like? I mean, would it mean, would it mean well, a smaller I mean, NATO, for example? Well, I don't think it's going to mean a smaller NATO. We have the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, it's existed in some form since 1975. That could maybe you be used to discuss some of these issues. At the moment, the Russians uh, are, very, are very critical of the OSCE. That might be a start. Beijing today voted with Moscow against holding the Security Council meeting in public, saying, um, and I'm quoting here, now what we need is quiet diplomacy, not microphone diplomacy. I mean, that wasn't a surprise to people who, who know the histories of Russia and China, particularly at the UN. But what, what do you think the outcome of this, this crisis over Ukraine? What is it going to, to teach us 
about the U.S.'s policy towards China? I mean, will it impact the U.S. foreign policy regarding China? Well, I think it's already impacted that policy because the Biden administration is spending an inordinate amount of time now dealing with Russia and this Russia-Ukraine crisis, whereas it wanted to focus on dealing with China. And that was the point of trying to create a stable and predictable relationship with Russia. I think the other lesson from this is, of course, the worse the animosity, uh, the ad adverse relationship between Russia and the West is the more this sort of pushes Russia towards China, makes it more dependent on China, because in the end, China is really going to be the only country to which Russia will turn um, if there is an incursion and even if there isn't um, in such a tense relationship. So we are, in a sense, aiding and abetting the greater dependence of Russia on mm. China. I've got about 30 seconds left, Professor Stent. Let me just ask you, um, do you think we're going to see a military confrontation um, over Ukraine? I hope not. Uh, I think at the moment it's too early, in a sense, to say that we won't. Uh, but we could see a confrontation that's short of a full military invasion, but has other aspects, cyber, uh, a more, some kind of more limited action. I think we will see something happen. All right, Professor Angela Stent joining us tonight from Washington, D.C. Professor Stent, it was good to have you on the program. Please come back and join us again. Thank you. I will. Thank you.